IP address provides an identity to your network device, so what does it reveal about you? Your IP address can show the country, region and city from which you connect to the internet in real time. Using IP address lookups, anyone can get details such as your internet service provider or host name. Why is that important? Combining your online activity and IP location data allows snoopers to get a profile of who's accessing the internet from that specific IP address. Your internet service provider can check and log your browsing history, it means authorities can get all personal details about any internet user, including name, address, phone number, and credit card details upon request. Associating your IP address with your online activity provides advertisers with insights about your ad preferences so that brands can serve you highly targeted ads. They can also add your IP to a specific list used for IP targeting. When using a VPN, your IP address stays inaccessible to snoopers and cyber criminals. Sign up today at nordvpn.com forward slash Mark Felton and enter the promo code Mark Felton to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. By the time Christmas Day arrived in Stalingrad, it was clear to the trapped German 6th Army that they were never going to be rescued from the devastated city. Hope of relief had ended the day before on Christmas Eve, when the huge rescue effort had finally been called off. So what had gone wrong, and why had the relief of the 6th Army not been successful? This is the story of Operation Winter Storm, the mission to relieve Stalingrad that raged in the days before Christmas 1942. Stalingrad is one of the most famous battles of World War II, and one of the most unnecessary. It can be argued that Stalingrad effectively destroyed Germany's hopes of victory in Russia and forced the Germans permanently onto the defensive in the east. Following the June 1941 invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, the Germans achieved huge successes against the Red Army, capturing millions of prisoners and arriving at the gates of Moscow as the harsh Russian winter stopped further operations. Stalin was able to unleash a winter offensive with fresh troops in the Moscow sector, pushing the Germans back from the capital, and Leningrad was placed under German siege. In the spring, Hitler decided to strike south, unleashing his panzers in another spectacular drive into southern Russia, the objective being the capture of the oil fields of the Caucasus, to both supply his own armies and starve the Red Army of fuel. Again, huge encirclements of Soviet armies occurred. Then, in late August 1942, the Germans reached the Volga River at an industrial city called Stalingrad. A major Soviet industrial centre and transport hub, its capture was desirable, though it could also have been bypassed, isolated and left to wither on the vine. However, the city also bore Stalin's name and was a great prize for Hitler. And because of its association with the Soviet leader, the Red Army was as determined to prevent the Germans from taking it. The German Sixth Army began the fight through the city, unwisely bombed to ruins by the Luftwaffe in an effort to reach the Volga. The Soviets shipped in thousands of troops to prevent the city's capture, and a bloodbath ensued, as the Sixth Army's units were fed into a sausage machine that chewed them up at an alarming rate, all for a pile of ruins on the river. By mid-November, the Germans had captured, at great cost, most of Stalingrad along the west bank of the river Volga. However, the Soviets spotted an opportunity. Due to manpower shortages, the flanks of the German 6th Army and part of the 4th Panzer Army were being protected by much weaker Romanian armies. In Operation Uranus, on the 19th of November 1942, huge Soviet attacks struck the Romanians and weaker German forces north and south of Stalingrad, eventually cutting off the 6th Army and part of the 4th Panzer Army in the city. At this point, a sensible commander would have ordered the 6th Army to fight its way out and withdraw to stabilise the front line. But Hitler, fixated on the city that carried his arch-enemy's name, refused to contemplate a withdrawal. He instead ordered the 6th Army to stay put and defend itself. In the meantime, the Luftwaffe would supply all its needs by air, 
a hopelessly optimistic notion, while the Germans would regroup and launch a fresh ground attack to link up with the Sixth Army. The problems with this plan were numerous. Firstly, the Soviets grew stronger and stronger. Winter arrived, complicating all movements and combat actions, and the Luftwaffe, despite Hermann Göring's personal guarantee, could not fly in sufficient supplies to keep the Sixth Army at maximum efficiency, or even minimum efficiency, come to that. Instead, the Sixth began to wither as the wounded and sick piled up, food supplies diminished, fuel ran out for the tanks and vehicles, and ammunition shortages severely hampered its ability to defend itself. But the Germans had a plan, Operation Winter Storm, the brainchild of one of Germany's greatest field marshals, Erich von Manstein. The plan should save the 270,000 German, Romanian and Croatian troops trapped in Stalingrad. Manstein commanded Army Group Don, composed of the 4th Panzer and 2nd German armies and the 3rd and 4th Romanian armies. With the 6th Army only receiving 20% of the daily tonnage of supplies that it needed by air, time was of the essence. The Red Army was busy digging in strong forces west of the city to prevent the 6th Army from fighting its way out, as the Soviets assumed it probably would. The relief effort commenced on the 12th of December 1942, when the 6th and 23rd Panzer Divisions of the 4th Panzer Army's 57th Corps drove northeast, surprising the Soviet 51st Army, managing to get into its rear areas and sowing confusion. But soon Soviet pressure built up again as they reorganized themselves and attacked. The next day, the 6th Panzer Division began fighting the Soviet 5th Tank Army, but the Soviets recovered and after some big tank actions were able to push the Germans back. Following more intense combat, the 6th Panzer Division, despite heavy losses, pushed the Soviets back towards the Mishkova River. Elsewhere, Soviet forces repeatedly counterattacked the Germans, trying to slow down their advance on Stalingrad, while the Soviet High Command, the Stavki, distributed reinforcements to help them. On the 16th of December, the Soviets struck at the flank of Manstein's Army Group Don, partially overwhelming the Italian 8th Army by the 18th of December. Manstein knew that he couldn't defend his left flank and also thrust at Stalingrad simultaneously. The 57th Panzer Corps was still advancing slowly towards Stalingrad, but it was not progressing fast enough against increasing Soviet resistance, despite the 17th Panzer Division being added to the attacking force. Added to this was the surprise Soviet tank raid on Tatskinskaya Air Base, the main Luftwaffe hub used to supply Stalingrad. Manstein pleaded in vain with Hitler to allow the 6th Army to try and fight its way west to link up with the advancing 17th Panzer Corps, but Hitler refused. On the 19th of December, Manstein's chief intelligence officer, Major Eismann, was flown to Stalingrad to confer with the 6th Army's commander, Colonel General Friedrich Paulus. Paulus also wanted to break out. But his chief of staff, General Arthur Schmidt, who exercised a great deal of dominance over the affable and retiring Paulus, ruled such a move out. Better the 6th Army be properly supplied by air, he said. Paulus now changed his mind and agreed to stay put as per Hitler's order. The same day, Paulus arrived at this calamitous decision. The vanguards of the 57th Panzer Corps got across the Aksé River and drove forward to within just 30 miles of Stalingrad. But despite this short distance between them, Paulus still refused to order a breakout west to link up with the 57th Panzer Corps. He argued that his tanks and other vehicles were too short of fuel to manage it, which is debatable. Fuel and ammunition could probably have been found to supply a few dozen vehicles to punch through the Soviet lines, with the infantry following behind. But the brief window of opportunity slammed shut the next day when a blizzard raged across the region, bringing most military operations to a close. By Christmas Eve, the push to Stalingrad was over, the 4th Panzer Army redeploying its forces to attempt to stave off strong Soviet attacks on Army Group Don. Stalingrad and the 6th Army were now doomed. 
The 270,000 trapped Axis soldiers were surrounded by over one million Soviets, with supplies of everything dwindling. Yet they fought hopelessly on, many fearing Soviet capture above everything else. Christmas Day 1942 was marked in a strange manner. All across the Stalingrad cauldron, German units fired coloured flares into the winter sky in an eerie display. By New Year 1943, the closest German forces to Stalingrad were 40 miles to the west, but this gap grew wider and wider as the Soviets hammered the Germans and also fought to reduce the 6th Army inside the pocket. By now, the 6th Army served only one useful purpose to the Germans, tying down huge numbers of Soviet frontline units that would have been used to attack the German front instead. The 6th Army, dwindling by the day, fought on. On the 30th of January 1943, Hitler promoted Paulus to field marshal in the express belief that he would shoot himself rather than surrender, as no German field marshal had ever surrendered. The next day, Paulus was taken captive after his headquarters was overrun. The last significant German pocket of resistance surrendered on the 2nd of February 1943. 270,000 men were trapped in Stalingrad at the time of the Soviet encirclement in late November 1942, a figure reduced to just 91,000 taken prisoner in February 1943, among them 22 generals. Of this number, only some 5,000 would survive the Soviet labor camps to see their families again. I've made a video about the 10,000 or so Germans who held out in the ruins of Stalingrad in small pockets and groups after the official surrenders, fighting on until March 1943. Link in the end screen. Not for the first time in World War II, Hitler's refusal to let his generals fight battles using common sense and sound military judgment, and his fixation with capturing enemy cities, would ensure Germany's defeat. A very Merry Christmas to all of my subscribers and viewers. Don't forget to visit my audio channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.